fired from his job and moving across the country 10 times before he was 15 years old, Dave Thomas didn't have many prospects. And when he dropped out from school to work at a restaurant full-time, there appeared to be even less hope. But a chance encounter turned the direction of his life radically and helped him build one of the biggest fast food chains on the planet. This is the story of Wendy's. Chapter 1 – Dave Thomas Born in 1932, during the Great Depression, Dave Thomas was born into a tumultuous childhood in New Jersey. Left by his birth parents, he was adopted by Rex and Avula Thomas. Tragically, he then lost his adopted mother when he was just five years old and was raised largely by his grandmother. But he had hard work instilled in him from a young age. His widowed father traveled long and far for employment, marrying three times but never settling. By the time Dave was 12, they were located in Knoxville, Tennessee, and they had moved over 10 times. This is where he earned his first job at a restaurant, putting his work ethic to use with long, 12-hour shifts. At a fine dining establishment named Riga's Restaurant, Dave's work ethic didn't prove to be a problem, but it would be his first major misstep in the hospitality industry. Dave was already forming strong opinions about how the business should be run and what he did and didn't want in his future business. For now, though, Dave was too young to have any power, and he clashed with the boss repeatedly, who eventually fired him. This only gave greater determination to Dave, who swore never to be fired from a job again. A couple of years later, he joined his father, who was employed 400 miles away. He began working at the Hobby House restaurant in Fort Wayne, Indiana. This time, he was committed, and after moving several times in his childhood already, he wasn't willing to move again. Dave was working so much that he began failing at school. When his father left town, chasing employment once again, Dave didn't follow. Instead, he threw everything he had behind his work life. He would later say that he deeply regretted leaving school early, but at the time, he felt it was the right gamble. Having nowhere else to stay, he briefly moved in with the family who ran the hobby house, the Klauses, before finding a room at the local YMCA. At barely 18, Dave then volunteered for the U.S. Army. He could see the draft for the Korean War approaching and wanted to make sure that he was able to do something valuable with his time. He requested to be sent to the Cooks and Bakers School in Fort Benning, where soldiers were taught culinary skills. He was later dispatched to West Germany as a mess sergeant and by the time he left, had been promoted to staff sergeant. This was the only formal training that Dave was ever given. But armed with professional experience, he was able to build an empire. Chapter 2 – An Unlikely Mentor When Dave returned from the army to Fort Wayne, he resumed his job as a cook at the Hobby House. During his time in the military, he had been cooking and managing 2,000 soldiers, teaching him to coordinate a large-scale operation. In the mid-1950s, a man came looking for this expertise. Curiously dressed in a white suit and a black string tie, approaching the hobby house with a proposition. He was looking to build new franchises for his business, and his name was Colonel Harlan Sanders, who had only rebranded and begun franchising Kentucky Fried Chicken a few years earlier. Phil Klaus, the owner of the hobby house, was excited about the prospect, and Phil bought four KFC franchises. But within just a couple of years, Klaus was hemorrhaging money and desperately needing someone to turn things around. So he offered Dave a 45% share if he could make them profitable. Dave was up for the challenge and didn't hesitate to make changes. He streamlined the menu, cutting down the 100 items to just a few, and emphasized the restaurant's specialty in chicken to build brand recognition. He also used Colonel Sanders' image as the prominent face for the company. These changes would remain a staple for the future of the business. Colonel Sanders had been a kind of mentor for Dave, but the young cook made some of the most important contributions for KFC's future success. And improving himself, Dave had also delivered on his promise to Phil Klaus, leading all of his four stores to extraordinary profit. As per the agreement, Dave was given a 45% stake in the franchises. In 1968, he sold his shares for a value of $1.5 million. 
which would be worth almost $15 million today. He was only 35, and incredibly, he still hadn't begun what would make him famous. Dave had become so valuable to Sanders that he was promoted to regional director of the company. Having climbed to the highest rungs of success at KFC, the very next year, he began his own restaurant. Located in downtown Columbus, Ohio, it was time for KFC to reap what they sowed. Colonel Sanders had given a fast food business genius the knowledge, money, and power to become one of their biggest competitors. Now with time and capital in his hands, Dave sketched out his business. He decided to name it after his fourth child, Melinda. Pictures of her with her red pigtails pulled up behind her head in a blue and white dress would form the company's logo. But Melinda was much better known for her nickname, which was set to become the most famous redhead in the world, Wendy. Chapter 3 – Wendy's Armed with enough money to begin his own operation, Dave's new restaurant, Wendy's, got off the ground quickly. Opening at the end of 1969, the first Wendy's quickly became known for its distinctive, old-fashioned square beef patties, a shape that stuck out of the buns. The patties were fresh and never frozen, making for juicy, well-cooked meat. Other trademark products, like the Frosty, the thickest milkshake on the market, were also present from the company's inception. But he was careful to take on board the lessons from KFC to keep the menu small and simple with only five items. Dave furnished the store with a warm, family-friendly design, marking it apart from its competition. Customers dining in were treated to a cozy carpeted area with proper seating, making it an attractive place to visit. The following year, Dave Thomas opened another Wendy's in Columbus, this time further out from downtown. It allowed him to revolutionize the fast food industry by installing the world's first pickup window. While the concept had been around for decades, Wendy's developed the first modern drive-thru, where customers could order their food through a speaker first before proceeding to a separate window. This made service exponentially more efficient. It wasn't long before every other fast food restaurant employed the same idea. In 1972, Dave began running television commercials, the same year that he licensed the idea for franchising meaning that he could expand the business much more rapidly. Along with a wave of new locations, the TV campaign used a cartoon Wendy, developing the character as a welcoming face for the chain, but also as a recognizable logo. Their Where's the Beef campaign, which took aim at its competitors McDonald's and Burger King, exaggerating the smaller size of their patties, the advertisement was so successful that it became a widely used catchphrase making its way into film, television, bumper stickers, and even turned into a song. On the back of this PR success, over the next decade, Wendy's expanded aggressively. By 1975, there were 100 restaurants, which was soon accompanied by the first location outside of the United States, in Canada. Just three years later, Wendy's celebrated their 1,000th store, totaling more than $1 billion in sales over the company's first decade which was unprecedented in the industry. In 1982, Dave Thomas stepped down from his position at the head of the company. He hadn't anticipated Wendy's growing so rapidly, but he didn't imagine that it would plummet just as quickly, forcing him to return much earlier than he anticipated. Chapter 4 – A Brave New Era In the 1980s, Wendy's went on to dominate its competitors on a crucial playing field – advertising. They were throwing resources behind their television commercials, which became renowned for their creativity and effectiveness. This led to $76 million of earnings in 1985, equal to over $200 million today. But disaster soon struck. A series of bad management decisions, including an ambitious breakfast menu, led to a $4.9 million loss the next year and one-fifth of Wendy's restaurant on the brink of failure. Having only enjoyed a few years away from the office, Dave Thomas returned, employing an old business associate, James W. Near, to CEO. Immediately, big changes were made. Hundreds of employees were fired, and the restaurant's design was simplified to allow for quicker build time while increasing cleanliness. Across the board, costs were slashed. A huge source of costs for franchises was the rapid rate of employee turnover. 
to combat this, Wendy's gave their workers much better conditions by increasing pay and bonuses, while offering them a stock option. This quickly halved the turnover rate, giving employees a reason to stay committed to the company. As for the menu, Wendy's had long been criticized for its expensive use of ingredients. As they were being attacked by competitors who were offering massively discounted items, retaining the quality of the ingredients, Wendy's introduced the Super Value Menu in 1989 to give the people the cheap price they wanted, with the menu made up of cheap 99-cent items. And Dave Thomas was featured in a string of commercials where he guaranteed a refund for any customer who didn't believe it was the best-tasting hamburger available. That year, Wendy's had a massive 20% earnings growth. Dave and James W. Neer had saved the company, turning it back in the right direction and opening up another decade of success. But the company would never experience the growth it did in the 1980s in the United States. To continue, they had to go global. Chapter 5. Going International Throughout the 1990s, spreading to Latin America, Eastern Europe, and Asia, there was even a store on a U.S. naval base in Italy. But its primary markets remained the United States and Canada. But the expansion wasn't as smooth as throughout the 1980s. The new CEO, Gordon Teeter, admitted that he made every mistake you can make until he realized that Wendy's strength was sticking to the basics. In one year alone, he closed 60 restaurants that weren't performing well enough, including withdrawing from South Korea, United Kingdom, and Argentinian markets. New healthy alternatives appeared on the menu, and for the first time, Wendy's offered late-night dining, which saw profits began to rise again by the end of the 90s. In 2002, 10 years after Dave Thomas was diagnosed with cancer, it claimed his life, just six months before his 70th birthday. At the time, there were over 6,000 Wendy's restaurants, with sales of over $7 billion a year. David built himself a personal net worth of $4.2 billion and had become an American celebrity, largely through his appearance in hundreds of Wendy's commercials over the years. A year after his diagnosis, he attended Coconut Creek High School to finally complete his high school, after dropping out more than 40 years earlier. Dave also began his own educational facility, the Wellington School, and contributed to several philanthropic causes, including founding an adoption organization, which Wendy's continues until this day. His legacy was ensured, and his children continued to run a selection of Wendy's franchises. But following Dave Thomas's death, the restaurant chain was once again suffering from a lack of leadership. Chapter 6. Into the Now in the 1990s, Wendy's had formed a merger with Canadian coffeehouse Tim Hortons, finding that combining a breakfast menu increased sales. Aside from acquisitions and mergers, though, Wendy's struggled to find investment with failing profits in the early 2000s. That changed in 2008, when Wendy's was taken over for $2.4 billion by Triarch, which renamed itself the Wendy's Company, and brought the fast food giant under the same ownership as rival Arby's, the company also moved its headquarters to Dublin, Ohio, close to where David started the first restaurant, and featured unique artifacts from Wendy's history to make a museum for visitors. Although it has fallen away from former rivals McDonald's and KFC, with new investment, Wendy's has been able to remain one of the biggest fast food chains in the world, still ranked number 13. Last year, the Wendy's company had almost $2 billion of revenue and employed 14,500 people, working in 29 different countries. In 2021, it opened its 1,000th international restaurant. Wendy's continues to serve classic hamburgers, like Dave Single, Double or Triple, and of course, their iconic Frosties. The secret to Wendy's success was Dave Thomas's commitment to his own vision. He refused to follow the rest of the industry. He wasn't afraid to keep meat fresh, despite increasing the costs, just to maintain quality. Thomas had quickly risen the ranks and excelled at KFC before understanding that he could do it even better himself. By combining old-fashioned techniques with modern innovations like the pickup drive-through window, Wendy's was given the foundation for decades of success.